In this video, we're going to look at vector fields. We're going to be able to recognize a vector field in a plane or in space. We're going to sketch some vector fields uh, given the equation, and we're going to identify a conservative field and its associated potential function. In this section, we're going to examine very basic definitions and graphs of vector fields so that we can study them later in better detail in this chapter. Now, vector fields are important because they describe many physical concepts such as gravitation and electromagnetism, which of course affect the behavior of objects over a large region of a plane of space. They're also useful with dealing with large-scale behavior such as atmospheric storms and deep-sea ocean currents. In this example below, we have a gravitational field exerted by the Earth and the Moon. The vector associated with a point gives the net gravitational force exerted by two objects on the same unit of mass. That would be these. The vectors of the largest magnitude, which would be this compared to something out here, in, the, in these figures are the ones that are the closest to the object. The larger the object is, this moon, or the Earth compared to the moon, has a greater mass, so it exerts a greater gravitational force in magnitude than the smaller object. So all of these would represent the gravitational force by the moon, and then all of these, as you get closer to the Earth, which is a larger body, would have a larger magnitude. In other words, they'd have a larger gravitational force. In this next example, we have the velocity of a river at points on the surface, shown below. Since the vectors to the left of the figure are small in magnitude, here and here, the water is flowing slower on those parts than further in. As the speed of the water increases, that'd be in this area, and then of course in this area you can see the magnitude, the length of the vector is longer, and it, the water flows like we'd expect that the velocity around the around this rock in the river is going to be a higher velocity than out here on the edges. And then if you notice, what ends up happening is that these change direction. And when this changes direction, it's called an eddy. In other words, a whirlpool happens, which is something that engineers, when they're building bridges, try to avoid is having these eddies around the, the um, backside of the pillars because this can undermine the structure of where the pillars are placed. When we're looking at vector fields, we're basically looking at maps of vectors in R2 or R3. And here's a formal definition. A vector field F in R2 is an assignment of two dimensional vectors F, noted as F, X, Y, to each point X, Y of a subset D of R2 and the subset D is the domain of the vector field. The vector field F in R3 is an assignment of three-dimensional vector F of X, Y, and Z to each point X, Y, Z of the subset of D in R3. The subset D is the domain of the vector fields. So let's start with vector fields in R2. We can express the vector fields in R2 as a function P, which has X and Y, and a function Q that has X and Y, or we may write it as P, as a, at this function, this field, as a function P, X, Y, and Q, X, Y, multiplied by the I and the J appropriately. Vector fields are said to be continuous if its component functions are continuous. Some important things that we get from vector fields. We want to think about explosions. If we have a radial field, this, think about explosions. All the vectors are either pointed directly toward or directly away. An explosion would be an example where it would be directly away from the origin or the, the, where the placement of the explosion was put. The magnitude of any vector depends only on its distance from the origin. Vectors located at the point x, y is perpendicular to the circle centered around the origin or centered around where the explosion happened and contain, contains a point x, y, and all the vectors on the circle have the same magnitude. As an example, here is a radial. Now, all, the, all of the vectors in this inner circle all have the same magnitude. 
And then all the vectors out here have the same magnitude. And then of course we can continue to draw these circles out. And if you're thinking, wow, that looks like contour maps, you would be correct. There's gonna be a connection between contour maps and our vector fields. Another important vector field that we see in R2 is a rotational field. This is like hurricanes, cyclones, and twisters. The properties that come with this is that the vectors at the point x, y are tangential, not perpendicular to the circus, circle with that center of radius r. Notice how they all circle around. And all the points either point in the clockwise or counterclockwise direction, and the magnitude of the vector depends only on its distance from the origin. So the further you get out, in this case, the larger the vectors become. And you can, again, see that you can see the transition from these white vectors into the red vectors, into the orange vectors, into the green teal, into the blue. Vectors in R3 can be expressed in two manners, either the vector field f, x, y, z, as p is a function of x, y, z, q is a function of x, y, z, and r is a function of x, y, z, or wrote in the i, j, k component. And of course, again, it is said to be continuous if its component functions are continuous. Just like when we were first learning vectors, we can talk about the unit vector. We call it the unit vector field. If the magnitude of each of the vectors in the field is 1, and unit vectors, the only relevant information is the direction of the vector, so the magnitude doesn't matter. They're important when we're talking about a fluid, and we only care about the direction in which the fluid is flowing, such as like air or water, but we don't really care about how strong the fluid is flowing. The magnitude itself is irrelevant. irrelevant. So we have this f function of p, q, and r as a vector field, and the corresponding unit vector would be the p divided by the magnitude of the vector, q divided by the magnitude of the vector, and r divided by the, mu the um, magnitude of the vector field that is. And then lastly, if f is a vector field, then the process of dividing f by its magnitude into unit form is called normalizing the field. So let's start with drawing some vector fields. The way in which we draw the vector fields are pretty straightforward. We choose any point in the xy plane or xyz um, three co coordinate system. So let's just choose a point. Let's choose the point one comma one. Now we're going to put one comma one into our vector. And when I put in one comma one, I'm going to have one i plus one j. So when I go to one comma one, I'm going to draw a vector that is one in the i and one in the j. And so it would look like that. And then I would do another one, say I would do one comma two. Then I'd put wherever I see x, I put in one. Wherever I see j, I, wherever I put see y, I put in two. Don't forget to put the hat because it represents their vectors. So I would go to one comma two and it would look something like this. And I would continue to draw these vectors by choosing points. So maybe I'll choose negative one, negative one. So it'd be negative one i and then minus one j. So I'd go to negative one, negative one, and I'd draw that vector. And I would continue with however many vectors that I would need just to kind of get an idea of what's going on. So maybe I'll choose negative two, negative three. So it'd be negative two, negative three, and write it like that. So I go to negative two and then down to negative three and its vector would look something like that. And I would continue drawing my vector field by hand. A little tedious. I would recommend that you use a, a graphing utility device of some sort. Um, the one that we use in class, the the one that we've been using for three-dimensional graphing actually does vector fields in 2 and 3D. And we'll talk about that in class um, when we cover this section. When we're in a three space, it's something similar. Now I would choose, say, 1, 1, and 1. So it would be 2 times that 1 in the i, minus 2 times 1 in the j direction, and then minus 2 times 1 in the k direction. 
So I'd have a vector which is 2, negative 2, and negative 2. So I would go to the point 1, 1, 1, which is about right here. And 1 in the x, 1 in the y, 1 in the z. And then from that point, I would draw a vector that is 2 in the x, negative 2 in the y, and negative 2 in the z. So 2 in the x is like here. 2 in the y, negative 2 in the y would be down, so it would be something like this. And then 2 in the z, of course, would be down, so we're looking at maybe about right there. Well, that's not a very good place for it, but anyways, it looked like something like that would be what the vector would be. And I would continue to do this. Again, doing the, the vector planes is really difficult in three spaces, these vector fields not planes, but vector fields in 3Space, terribly difficult, I would recommend you using a graphing device. Now we know from previous sections when we were doing partial derivatives and we learned about directional derivatives and we, we learned that the, um, the directional derivative, the gradient, is a vector. And this special kind of vector that we have at the gradient is called a conservative field. And these fields are extremely important when in physics, when we're talking about systems where the energy is conserved. Gravitational fields and electric fields are associated with static charges are examples of gradient fields. Now from 4.6, we know that the gradient of F can be denoted with this upside down triangle, F, where each component, the, the function, the partial derivative of X with res, partial derivative with respect to X of my function, and the I, the partial derivative of my function uh, with respect to y in my j, and of course in 3 space, I'd have my last one, which would be the partial derivative with respect to z in my k direction. So the vector field f, r2, and r3 is called a gradient field if there exists a scalar function f such that the gradient of f is equal to this vector field. In this situation, f is a potential function, and in some applications, you will see it defined in this form, the negative of the gradient of f is equal to the vector field f. We also pick up this uniqueness. So let f be a conservative vector field on an open connected domain and let f and g be two functions such that the gradient of f is equal to f and the gradient of g is also equal to f. Then there must be a constant c such that f is equal to g plus c. So they're asking me on this one if the vector field is a gradient field. So I want to know, is this a conservative field? So that means I must have some function phi, or whatever you want to call it. You can call it whatever you want, just not f and g. I'm going to call it function phi, x and y, such that the partial derivative with respect to x of x, y, would be equal to the sine of x plus y, and there must also be some partial derivative with respect to y of xy, which would equal the cosine of y plus x. Now, if I integrated this first one with respect to x, I'd have the sine of x plus y dx. And then I would have also have had some function of y there. Um, and this could be a, my phi of xy. So I integrate this, and I'm going to, with respect to x, I'm going to get negative cosine of x plus xy plus some function of y. If I integrate this other one, it also could be my choice for phi, so x comma y. I'm going to integrate this as the cosine of y plus x with respect to y this time, because that would have been my partial derivative with respect to y. And then it would have also some function here, this g of x. And when we, when we integrate this, we're going to get the sine of y um, plus xy plus g of x. Now, this was my two choices. And notice that they both have the xy. So I know my phi of xy is going to have xy in it. And I also notice that this negative cosine of x is a function of g of x, so it's a good choice to have that cosine of x there. 
Similarly, I have the sine of y is a function of y only, so I probably have plus the sine of y. And so there we have shown that this is a vector field that is a gradient field because we were able to find this function that would satisfy those two partials. Then I'm just asked to find the gradient vector field, and this is just like we expect back from 4.6. It is literally just finding the partial derivatives with respect to x, y, and z if there is there. So this is going to be equal to, I'm going to do the partial of this function with respect to x, which is just going to give me the sine of y, because a cosine of y would be considered a constant. And I'm going to do the, the partial with respect to y. x will come along uh, as a constant, so it will be x, the cosine of y minus the sine of y. And that's it, or you could write it as the sine of y in the i direction, plus x, the cosine of y minus sine of y in the j direction, however you want to write it. These are the same thing. And then this one with respect to x, y, and z, so here's my gradient vector, which is going to be with respect to x, it's going to be z, e raised to the negative x, y, and then the derivative of negative x, y, which is negative y, and then z, e raised to the negative x, y, and then the derivative of negative x, y, which would be negative x. And then my last one, z is what I'm doing respect to, so that means e is the constant, e raised to the negative x, y. And I'm just going to rewrite this to clean it up a little bit as negative y, z, e raised to the negative x, y, negative x, z, e raised to the negative x, y, and then lastly, e raised to the negative x, y. Okay, now if we take a look at our example right here, and I, and I went out and I graphed this with some of the level curves, it's behaving exactly the way that we would expect it to behave. If the level curves are close together, my magnitude of the vectors are longer. When they're further apart, they're shorter. Now, I, I'm not, I don't have all the level curves, it's just some of them. And I could tell you that whatever level curves are going to be in this direction will also be really close together because of the length of them. And of course, I'm seeing my vectors are going to be running perpendicular to my level curves. So this kind of brings in our level curves, brings in the vectors. It also helps us think about how the shape looks based on the way the vectors are. And if this represented a topographical map in which it you know, you could see how the water would flow. The water would flow quickly down in here, and then it kind of slowed in this area, and then it flows quickly out in each direction here. So it's a really good way of visualizing the way fluid would flow if this is a topographical map. Okay, so conservative fields also have a special property called the cross partial property. And this will help test whether or not a given vector is a conservative, but it doesn't actually tell us other than it's not. So this, all this does is tell us that it is not a conservative vector. It doesn't confirm that it is. It just tells us it's not. And we're going to spend some more time later in this chapter on conservative vector fields. And so we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. This is just the beginning of it, and it, and it should be that... Something we know that here's, here's, a, here's the end result. If you're in two space with this function p and this function q, then the partial of p with respect to y needs to be the partial of q with respect to x. That's what it means, the cross partial property. And of course, in three space, the partial of p with respect to y must equal the partial of q with respect to x, and the partial of q with respect to z must equal the partial of r with respect to y. And lastly, the partial of r with respect to x must equal the partial of p with respect to z. Okay. A couple of other things that come here is the flow line or streamline of a vector field is a curve, r, which is a vector of t, such that dr dt is equal to f with r inside it. If f represents a velocity of a field moving particle, and then the flow lines are paths taken by the particle. Therefore, flow lines are always tangent to the vector field. 
for the following show that the given curve C of t is a flow line in the given velocity of f. And so here is my curve. Here's how I'm going to describe my curve where t can equal 0. And here is my vector field. And what we need to prove is my derivative with the r vector, which is x, y, and z, dt, is equal to the derivative with respect to t of c of t, which is going to be the derivative d of t of my vector e raised to the t, the natural log of the absolute value of t, 1 over t, and this needs to equal f. Since r, vector r, so I'll put a hat on there, or yeah, I'll put a hat on there, of x, y, and z, multiplied by the vector x, y, and z, is equal to my c of t, which we know is still equal to e of t, natural log of the absolute value of t, 1 over t. This tells us that x must be equal to e of t, y must be equal to the natural log of the absolute value of t, and z must equal to 1 over t. Now, if I take the derivative of each one of these with respect to t, then my first derivative, d of d of t, e to the t, is going to be e to the t all day long. And d dt of the natural log of the absolute value of t is going to be 1 over t. And then my last one, d dt of 1 over t, is going to be equal to negative 1 over t squared. So I end up with e to the t, 1 over t, negative 1 over t squared, which this is equivalent to x, 1 over t is z, so 1 over t squared must be negative z squared. So that's what I got, and that means either a, they're not equivalent, or b, I made a mistake and that shouldn't be a 2 there, and I'm guessing I probably shouldn't have had a 2 there. So if the 2 isn't there, then I have found that these are equivalent. If I had a 2 there, then I've shown that they are not equivalent. Assuming that they are equivalent, C of t is a flow line of the given velocity vector field. f of x, y, and z. And that's it for this section. Um, it's not a long video. The next section is going to be long. There's a lot going on in the next section. So um, I'll get that video out soon so you can have time to review it, watch it, become one with it, because it will be long. And we'll see you on Tuesday.